And you know, Joseph, I didn't tell you this, but we are going to uh, we're going to be, you know, uh, this joke is failing. I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I read something and it just yeah. I'm glad you know you got you got to pull the plug. I feel like you were going to go with, and we're going to do live commentary afterwards, or we're going to do (laughs) play-by-play analysis. We're going to break it down. You know me well, John Madden style. If Kamal Harris throws to the receiver in the end zone, it's a touchdown. Maybe a little Joe Montana. Uh, I can't believe it. You know, just you know, whatever, you know. All right. It is uh, Wednesday, October the 7th. This is Game of This Podcast, episode 419. I'm Aaron, one of the hosts here. Uh, Tiny is here. Hey, I am here and having a better time already tonight. As compared to what? <laughs> I, okay. I wasn't saying. actually going to say it out loud. <laughs> Then watching the VP president or the, the VP debate. Understood. Uh, and Understood. just angrily tweeting like most of yep. uh, the American public that's on Twitter, which I realize is also not representative of the American public. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Uh, Mike is here. <laughs> uh, the American public, I heard something. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, right on cue. Anyway, uh, we're always here, but uh, we have a guest this week. We have Joseph Chen joining us. Joseph Chen of Fantastic Factories fame. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you saying yes. I am a, a big fan of, of your work. It's always good to to have that positive feedback. I think it's <laughs> always great to hear from fans. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was my my favorite board game of analog game of last year. So yeah. Oh wow! And I got my wow. hands on it pretty late, and it it just you know it's one of those things. It just I was like, I like this. Well, the, the, the dice are so colorful. The mechanics. I'm, ve- so I'm very cool. honored. <clears throat> anyway. That's funny. I, sorry, I remember someone asked the question like, "Would you rather have sold like ten thousand games and have your game not be anyone's favorite, or mm-hmm. you know have only just a hundred games sold and it be everyone's favorite?" So it's always good, I think, to have. To be a favorite of someone's rather than being, you know, nobody's favorite. As long as you made some money along the way. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That money's I mean, nice. I would also <laughs> say, like, if, if it's 100 people's favorite, like, they're the best advertisement, I would assume, for your game. Like, they yeah. are going to introduce it to others and that whole I mean, word of mouth thing. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely like a hypothetical situation and definitely in a vacuum because right. it's not realistic in... <laughs> In a number of ways, but yeah. So, for those who don't, uh, I guess, know about uh, your background, how you got into board games, could you give us a little bit of a history on like how you got to Fantastic Factories, what you're doing with it now, and all that kind of good stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think the first kind of foray into hobby board games was maybe uh, 12 years ago or something, like at well, our through college and shortly after college started getting into like some of the classics like Catan, Seven Wonders, Dominion. And um, a few years later, just kind of decided, hey, let's let's make a board game. I think a, a group of friends and I were, were just looking for a project to pick up and like, how hard could it be to make a board game? Uh, well, it turns out there's quite a few things between, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> coming up with the idea and getting it published but you know at the time that was the project we wanted to kind of kind of do and one thing led to another and kind of here we are i mean there's certainly a lot of specifics in the journey but um happy to dive into any one piece if you guys are interested yeah i mean uh is fantastic factory is your first is that your first game were there other ones that preceded it it's um probably the first one that really put much effort into i think before that there may have been one other game that i prototyped once play tested once decided it wasn't really going anywhere uh but yeah fantastic factories first real design and first published game wow it, it, it i mean I, I don't know anybody the numbers or anything but i know the critical acclaim is it's really up there and I've, and obviously the expansions are on kickstarter now and that was funded in a day if part of a day or uh, I was busy um, spreading the word, but some people on my team said that they watched it cross the funding goal at nine minutes. So, man, <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of crazy. That's impressive. Uh, yeah, that 
was definitely beyond what I, I thought. Because so here's the thing: like we're um, for this expansion and for the base game, we've partnered with uh, Deepwater Games now to help kind of do a lot of the manufacturing, logistics, and distribution. Mm-hmm. And so there, we're running the campaign under their uh, their account, and so they're the ones who hit, you know, make the campaign live. And since I'm not actually technically the campaign creator, I could actually back my own game just to like uh, be what? part of that thing. Gotcha. Mostly for a QA, I think, like so I know exactly what people are seeing, mm. and uh, just to make sure the fulfillment process is smooth. <clears throat> so I tried to back the game as fast as I could. And I was number seven, I think. <laughs> so <laughs> that's good. I, I I don't know how that happened. Like they hit the button, I tried the back as fast as possible, and yet somehow I was still number seven. So <laughs> some people are just big fans, and they're, On top they're willing to show up right away, not to stay one, but you know, minute zero, and it's it's really incredible to me for sure. Wow, and I guess that that's really good considering that think about early this year obviously there's been no conventions there's no you know i, I mean I, I did i was introduced to it at pax unplugged but after that i mean if the conventions weren't in like in january february for the most part maybe march i don't know that was kind of it you know yeah it's crazy it's definitely once like covid hit the sales started slowing down and i know some distributors even just stopped distributing games for a short while mm-hmm and so, which is kind of disappointing given that um, our official retail release was in, I believe, February, and then COVID hit in like March. So uh, that really kind of put a damper in like the projected games to, uh, to sell. But in the last few months, things have really picked up. And we're actually, uh, as far as the uh, one, games we have on hand, are sold out. Uh, so distributors are sold out. So all the games that are available now are, are either in people's hands mm-hmm. or in retail stores, which is kind of crazy to think about. So this campaign is not only launching the expansion, but also funding for the second print run as well. Are there any significant changes you wanted to put into the second print run that you just weren't able to in the first? Uh, not really. I think there was one... So the main difference is that the second print run doesn't have the wooden token, factory token. I think Deepwater is interested in just trimming some of the uh, excess costs. We already had like a nice thick chipboard token that we could use as first player token, so we're using that instead. And there was like one or two spots in the rule book where the wording uh, was needed to be a little bit clearer. So that's about it. No, no functional changes really. Okay. Is the high roller going in all the second print uh your print runs? Uh no. So high roller is one of the promo cards. So that was available in the first Kickstarter campaign and also available in this uh new campaign, but it doesn't come in the box, it comes in a separate um separate little package. Uh okay. When I got mine, it it was one of the Kickstarter ones, so I, I got the high roller in there. I was like, Okay, this is nice. Yeah, that one's definitely a fun one. It's uh can be a little swingy sometimes, but it, it's, I don't know. I, I, I almost never hire a higher roller anymore because just on the first roll, it's just a one every time and just bomb <laughs> out immediately. I'll be honest. I've never done it. I, I've looked, I've thought about it. And I'm like, nah, I'm going <laughs> to go for hired hands or something like that. So, yeah. So well, now that you have you know, the Kickstarter has done amazingly well, you said nine minutes. That's impressive. Uh, I'm assuming you freed up, you have some more time to do other things. So what else have you been up to now that you have some time to sort of breathe and, and <laughs> some other things? Uh, no, actually, it's not really the case because oh, uh, okay. there's still a couple pieces of art left. Uh, there's The rule book needs laying out, the back of the box needs designing, and then there's preparing the files for manufacturing. But it is definitely kind of a sigh of relief a little bit in I think this time around running the campaign has been a lot easier because it's just, you know, second time around, a little bit more prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact is people ask when you run a Kickstarter campaign, everyone has like all these questions, like every question you could think about, they're going to ask, like, does the, does the expansions fit in the base game? 
do the expansions fit in the base game if you're the sleeved? Uh, you know, just can I back at a dollar and you know buy this stuff in the pledge manager, et cetera, et cetera? So handling all those questions, you know, takes some time. But I think this time around has been we've been able to anticipate a lot more of the answers. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a bit smooth, smoother. Um, but I think uh, I still do take some time to. I haven't had much time to play games, but you know, been watching TV in the evenings just to relax and unwind. Um, in particular, I, I don't know. If she, I assume most of you guys have uh, Netflix. Uh, the, I've been watching this uh, show called Three Percent. Actually, I finished watching it a few weeks ago. I watched the first season of it. This is the like dystopian future and you have like the ability to take it 20 year olds take a test and like they can essentially get to an aisle or to a paradise kind of deal but it's only three percent of them can make it yeah what are the yep, costs definitely. If, if you don't pass the test so at 20 pretty much everyone takes this test oh, and everybody does okay well technically you volunteer to take the test but everyone basically takes it and uh yeah, I mean, if you make it, you get to this paradise. If you don't, then you just have to live out the rest of your life in this like slum, basically, where mm -hmm. everyone's just impoverished and you know it's hard to come by clean water and food. And, uh, it's it's really interesting because you the first season focuses on the process in which they conduct a series of tests, and uh, it. It's interesting to see the dynamics between the characters, how each one tackles the test, whether they, uh, you know, cheat to get their way or um, ally of other people, and just to see like the rules of this kind of different world, and um, how it works. And then the other seasons go on to cover other things as well. So, and it's one of those rare shows where they actually are able to finish the show as well. They didn't just like cancel out of nowhere and then, you know, left everything unanswered so they were able to craft a pretty reasonable um ending that oh i guess i haven't read what people's reactions were but my reaction was okay that's a pretty fair ending unlike some other shows like you know game of thrones or something is this a british show because uh, it's um those shows end <laughs> without going on for <laughs> 90 seasons or whatever. there's it exceptions is, obviously but yeah it, it is a foreign language show i I, I believe it's I, Brazilian. I, yeah, I think it's Brazilian. Brazilian. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, other countries so actually, end a show. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yeah. Beginning, middle, end. You know. Well, I mean, they they ended over the what four se they they got renewed by Netflix for a fourth season, and we're told, hey, this will be your final season, kind of deal. So, like, but I wonder yes, they got they did, got to end it. Did the third season have a conclusion, and it was like, oh, money, fourth season, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, di he didn't burn up or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the end of the third season was, but I, I, I think each, yeah, I don't know. There, but, like there's at least the first one had a self-contained storyline. And I think I watched the first, like the couple of the second season and it, mm -hmm. like it, it continues part of the story, but Aaron, to your point, you referenced like British television. It's the same idea. Like you have a, con a, a, con a storyline that takes place during that season. And if, Hey, you get renewed for next year, there might be plot points that you continue on, but mm -hmm. you told your story in whatever your time frame was. Like, I mean, that's that's kind of what Doctor Who is, which is a bunch of single season stories that all tie together kind of nebulously afterwards. So just an anthology. They just haven't bothered come up with another name. <laughs> yeah, that's what yeah. I don't know. So. Obviously, there's common there's a there's common threads throughout all of them, I'm assuming, but I haven't seen Doctor Who in a very long time. There's so much of it. I was like, eh, I can't. I don't know. If I get in now, where would I get in? I don't, yeah. So. I mean, isn't it all on HBO Max or whatever? I don't have HBO Max. Mm. So. I mean, we could talk about that later, but. Okay. And and, and we will. So, Joseph, um, I see you're, you're watching Twitch again. What are you uh, enjoying on Twitch? Yeah, since I, I've been doing some streaming myself of uh, either the art or playtesting and just kind of getting back into Twitch. I used to watch Twitch a lot for um I used to watch a lot of League years ago, League of Legends. Okay. Um just like the LCS and the Worlds and whatnot. Haven't watched that in a while, but getting back into Twitch 
uh, seeing other board game streamers. Um, some friends of mine have been streaming art as well. Um, I, actually, there was a while I was watching the GTA uh, role playing like a couple of years ago, but uh, and then recently Slay the Spire. I, so I've been uh, before I started prepping for the Kickstarter, I was playing a lot of Slay the Spire and watching Jorbs and learning a lot. Slay the Spire, Slay the Spire is a game piece of game. Um, I think it's also on Switch. It's on everything, pretty much. Yeah, <clears throat> except not on mobile because that would probably. There is a mo- bad mobile port. Like I oh, saw okay. a lot of people. Oh. Just I've been playing this that was... Pirates thing on, which is clearly influenced by Slay the Spire. But yeah, I yeah. played the Pirates one. I think you mentioned it, and yeah. I played it for a while. I, I I lost a few hours, uh, many hours of sleep after you told me about that. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm sorry. I don't... <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a roguelike deck building game. So it will, f- yeah, all these different relics and cards you can get. So watching Twitch streamers, I, I, I always fall in this habit where I'll discover a game that has like high replay value. I'll play it a bunch and then inevitably I'll go to Twitch and watch someone else play it. Pirates and then I will. That's what it's called. And then I'll end up basically watching someone play the game more than I actually play it myself. So um, I love a good AGDQ or GDQ, SD, no, you know, games on quickly thing. I love watching that stuff. I'm not going to play those old games, but not some That's of them true. I will, but not to completion. So actually, I've been the, the latest thing I've been watching is Minecraft. Uh, a friend of mine started streaming Minecraft, and I was rediscovering Minecraft and all the things they've done because the last time I played it was before Microsoft even acquired them. Oh wow! And uh, and then I noticed like on stream, there's a lot of people doing speed runs of Minecraft, and so that's been really interesting to watch as well. How fast can you get from the beginning to the Nether? How how fast can that happen? Fifth, you can apparently defeat the end. What's it called? Ender Dragon mm-hmm. or whatever it's I called? Think so. uh, in about fifteen minutes. What? I, I think that was the so I because I, I saw these streamers doing it and failing to get like for far enough so i was curious and i looked it up and i think someone set a world record like a couple weeks ago 15 minutes Wow! so to get into the nether you just basically you have to find uh a village with a golem you get iron you make a bucket you get some water then you find a pool of lava and you craft another portal using water and lava as opposed to like uh mining for the the whatever what is it called is it obsidian or whatever it is yeah my, my girl well my youngest two would know they they come in and they, they're into it and they're not then they do roblox for well the youngest one does a lot of roblox but i just actually installed uh minecraft education edition on their on their chromebooks and they're very excited hmm. about that so they're like can we do modding i'm like well i mean basically the youngest one wants to do minecraft mods and i'm like well i don't, I don't mind if you do them i just don't you know, not on my desktop, not on my laptop. Like, you know, use your own stuff. <laughs> so I was like, oh, it, Education Edition is now on your Chromebook. There you go. It's a Bluetooth controller. Have fun, you know. So, What's the difference between the Education Edition and uh, other ones? That's a good question. I, I was, yeah, I was about to ask the I same thing. I don't know. <laughs> but mods still work. That's, I need to kind of see what the limit, there has to be some kind of limitation there. You have to answer like math questions every time you want to put down a block, like five <laughs> plus five. Ha ha. I guess one thing is it's free. Oh, so interesting. If she actually logs in with her school credentials, then it's free. Well, that's the thing. You can install it for free, but if you don't have yeah. a correct login, you can't get in to play it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Huh. So I oh. think that maybe that's, you know, it's opening it up for any and all who, you know, kids who are in school to, to jump in and start using Minecraft. So, yeah, my, my son's almost four, and I've been trying to teach him to play Stardew Valley, which, uh, just by starting by clearing my farm out, you know, mm-hmm. hit that rock, cut start, that tree. Start small and then work your way up. Yeah. Do these I, chores. <laughs> I, had to, <laughs> I had to install a mod to uh, slow down time because time passes by a little too fast for him. So, yeah. He'll get there. He'll get yeah. there. So outside of, you know, uh, I guess I'm working a day job and launching a successful Kickstarter and Twitch and everything. Anything else you've been up to as of late that you want to to share with us or the listeners? Uh, nothing much. I mean, uh, I mean, those are definitely time consuming things. I think. Uh, 
because of quarantine, you know, doing a lot more cooking lately, uh, less eating out, although that's slowly changing, I guess, as, you know, things are very, very gradually returning to normal. But, like, we developed a few, like, um, <clears throat> family favorites, I guess, recipes. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so, like, we've started doing more tacos, and I started making my own tortillas, which are surprisingly simple to 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 do so you got the making well, heart, the thing that flattens it out and all that stuff so yeah. that's the thing is that i actually didn't for, i both knew about them and forgot about them at the same time <laughs> okay how does that work so i was like i've seen them before but when i was making them it didn't occur to me that i should get one so i was just rolling them out with a rolling pin and okay. i was telling i mean like, that works you don't need a tortilla press Flattest yeah, I'm, I'm curious, like, how much easier it might be. Because, like, certainly the first time I did it, it was a little, a little rough. Like, <laughs> getting the right size. And I couldn't figure out how to, I hadn't, couldn't figure out how to roll it so they were round. So I got really weird looking tortillas, you know, ones that, like, shaped like a T, you know, like, <laughs> blobby on one tea side. For tortilla. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Different thicknesses and whatever. But I've done it, like, at this point, maybe like six, seven, or eight times. Mm -hmm. And so I've slowly gotten better and better at making this, these tortillas. And it's it's surprisingly pretty good. Like you wouldn't, uh, oh, maybe some of you already know this, but like apparently fresh, you know, fresh tortillas, there's definitely a difference compared oh, to yeah. like getting the ones store-bought. So. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I just buy a pack of them from Lidl and and devour them shortly. But I, I would, I don't know. I every time I buy a device for the kitchen and I don't use it a lot, I get looks. So if I want to buy a new one, it's mm. like, well, you, you know, you haven't used the sous vide in a while. You didn't. You haven't used. Why are you not using the sous vide more? Like, because <laughs> the... like at least once a week I'm using it. Because my first attempts at it didn't go very well, so I got kind of looks like, you know, is this the chicken? I'm like, yes. Is this it? I'm like, okay. <laughs> Chicken, chicken's <laughs> weird in sous, sous vide, but like fish and steak. So they're not really big on fish or steak. So maybe I just think I'm just cooking, doing sous vide mm -hmm. for me and for no one else. I don't know. Yeah. My sister, my sister's been talking about Instapot spaghetti and meatballs. Apparently, her kids no, love it now. Good. I have an Instapot, so. and I'll do beans and stew, and she, you know, I'll do all types of stuff in it. But yeah, Instapot is great. Yeah, I think the single use things like the tortilla maker are a little harder to sell, you know, like, or not hard to, sell, hard to justify buying, you know, because it's just it. one purpose. You're going to do one thing. So. Yeah. So I'll get there. I'm, I'm, not on, I'm not on the tortilla press life, but that would be kind of cool, though, to make your own. Yeah. Would, we'd, have, we'd have Taco Tuesday a lot more often if I could make my own tortillas. Yeah. You got to justify I, it. <laughs> it is super tempting because we have been doing it a lot, so... Maybe we'll see. Yeah. Right. I've also been making a lot of uh, gnocchi as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, I'm I'm a really big fan of Italian food, and for whatever reason, whenever I go to a restaurant, if the restaurant has gnocchi, I almost always have to order it if I haven't eaten the gnocchi at that restaurant before. <clears throat> I haven't had it enough, and I look at it in the store. I'm like, I should make something with that, and then I just pick up fettuccine and bow ties and you know the know, ingredients are else. surprisingly simple but um you know it's just potato flour egg and a little bit of salt it's just labor intensive to like do it all so it's just it that's never whatever it is i i look at that and i just go nah <laughs> <laughs> so here's the nice thing about like doing the recipe over and over again, you start learning where you can take shortcuts. And, uh, you know, and I've discovered a few tricks to getting my gnocchi uh, done well. So, like, they they suggest that you do a ricer for your potatoes, which mm -hmm. is, like, another one of those kind of, like, specialized tools that, like, I don't want to own a ricer just for this what dish. Why? Oh, but if you do uh, it all the time, you, I mean, geez, it pays for itself. But apparently you can just um, refrigerate. So like uh, 
So they say like boil the potatoes with the skin. And then when you're done boiling potatoes, like you peel the skin off while the potato's hot, which is like all a giant hassle. So what I do is I just microwave the potato and then I put it in the fridge for a few hours. Uh, then I peel the skin off and then I grate the potatoes with a cheese grater. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which, which does basically very similar thing to the ricer. So that's kind of yeah. my, my little hack, I guess. And then instead of rolling the gnocchi out, this is where it's kind of, this is probably blasphemy here. I will make kind of a square pancake and then I'll just cut them into squares. Okay. Instead of like rolling Makes them sense. out. Is it like yeah. A little, yeah. So, so they look less like pillows and look more like s- squares, I guess. But they still taste good. So, yeah, it's so all they're, about the taste. they're like raviolis at that point. Like they're shaped kind of like raviolis, but they're not, they're not stuffed. There's right. But, it. Well, and they're okay. pro- they're not as big as ravioli. You know? which, which you could, try to keep them. You could stuff them though, couldn't you? Is that a th- I don't know. Could could you? W- would you? W- Interesting. In this got complicated with a fox. <laughs> if you if you make them big enough, they're just pierogies. <laughs> you yeah, you've you got my fold them over. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, we got my brain like churning here, like. <laughs> Can I stuff them? What if I stuffed them with something? What if I just took the dough and wrapped things inside of it? Absolutely. Yeah. Carbs on carbs on carbs. I encourage yeah. it. It's, uh, <laughs> just the garlic bread inside of it. It's ancient right. human it's tradition to, to wrap things in carbs, right? Yeah. It works, you know, right? <laughs> bur- burritos, calzones. Uh, it's a food know. present. It's a You're great container. Open up and get something in. Dump- dumplings. You start yeah. with a supposed loaf of bread from Subway, so, and then oh, oh, you suppose it because of the sugar content. You, you, you just start wrapping and wrapping and wrapping, and at some point there's a yoga mat around the middle of it. But you know, you <laughs> you just keep going until you say, "I've I've put everything I could can uh, uh, you know fathom putting there, into my into my face." There's an SNL skit, I think. I was gonna say the the taco one where they start with. We're gonna put this taco in it. It's in a cheesesteak and it comes in a tote bag. Uh, <laughs> then we wrap it in a large pepperoni pizza. Right. Awesome. I have not tote bag full of salsa. Good. There was some. Uh, I don't know what country. I don't know, I, it was Australia. Said that the. It was Austria. Like the sugar. Content. I was gonna say it's a it's a European kind of. Oh, it was, it, was it was Ireland. It was it was Ireland. It was Ireland. It was Ireland. Yeah. Okay, so they said there was so much sugar in the bread at Subway, it could not be considered of, of bread. all varieties of bread. All of it was it is, and every single one. Right, it's considered cake, not bread. <laughs> not bread. It's it, it was it's all. Oh, they're just determining whether it is or is not taxed. That's yes. what all this was about. It's not that it's not food. They like not like the the years ago where they're like there's yoga mat material in the bread. So this is, you know, this was them saying you can't get by without charging tax. That's all it is. That tax is a thing. Yeah. It's kind of like the shoes versus slippers thing. Like apparently the tax laws are different for shoes versus slippers. So some companies, they'll just like add a little layer of fuzz on your shoes. So then they they can call it slippers. Slippers. Yeah. If if there are hard and defined rules about what is or isn't taxable, people will try to figure out ways of circumventing the tax. Yeah, I've heard the same thing for the X-Men figurines. So like if you have like a human like figurine thing, it's classified like as a doll or something like that, and it's taxed more. And so apparently they ironically were arguing that X-Men were not human Oh, they're mutants. They're, yeah, this they're, is, they <laughs> they're clearly in, not human. <laughs> in order to avoid that tax, which is funny because like that's kind of the thing is that they're trying to argue that they kind of are, but I don't know. Yeah. That's, that, that kind of specificity is interesting, but usually there's money that's the incentive, uh, saving it, spending less of it, whatever. So, interesting. All right. Anything else you want to share with us, Joseph? Uh, Mike, what have you been up to? So this past weekend, we engaged in an, an outdoor activity. I've um, done that once. It's, it was outdoors, but it was pretty crowded, I'll say. Um, it, was, uh, it was at a place called, uh, it's called Windridge Farm. They're a cidery slash brewery in, um, you know, central PA, uh, about 20 minutes from our house. And, it, you know, it, they just announced a thing. Hey, come out, sit on the lawn, bring your chair. You know, 
get a drink and enjoy some music being played off in the distance or whatever. And we're like, yeah, okay, why not? Sure, whatever. It doesn't even cost anything other than whatever we're buying. Um, and uh, yeah, it, I don't know whether they were anticipating that many people or not. Um, I mean, we were able to kind of like set up a little bit of distance away from, from people. But, you know, if you want to get anything, the lines were like, you figure on waiting 20 to 30 minutes to get a drink. It was like, okay. Uh, but, you know, it was something we did. And I don't know. I mean, there aren't, there aren't too many things going on. So that was, uh, that, and, and they, you know, they said it's their Oktoberfest uh, celebration. But I'm like, you guys don't even have like, an Oktoberfest style beer at all. Like, what are you even doing? <laughs> uh, so they're like, oh, well, we're, we're doing one of those, like, hold a, a giant, uh, you know, stein of water up in the air and whoever lasts the longest wins a, a prize. I'm like, yeah, if I was in that contest, I would be like, thanks for the mug. I'm gone. I don't need to hold this up for four seconds because I will lose and I will be in pain. So see you later um but it was yeah anyway it was it was uh it was something um and um i had mentioned it before but i've been watching more of ozark and um yeah it's still good it's not i mean i'm not my mind is not blown this isn't one of these shows where every episode i go oh i can't believe and you know like (laughs) you know i i I think Breaking Bad is a really good show, and I think there's a lot that this show has in common with Breaking Bad, but it just doesn't have those cliffhanger moments where the end of the episode, you're like, I can't wait to see the, the you know, what happens after that moment. I mean, the, you know, they have little things, and it's just like, oh, okay, yeah. And it's good, but no, I don't know. I've seen better, but it's it's worth watching. It's definitely worth watching. It's pretty well done. Um, the cinematography is kind of dark, though. It seems like whether it's daytime or nighttime, it doesn't matter. Everything's sort of like got this darkish, bluish haze to it. I'm like, eh, all right, I guess that's a choice. Um, but um, yeah, other than that, I yeah, I, I probably did a little of this, a little of that, whatever. But uh, um, you know, trying to live live my life and continue <laughs> to stay healthy. I guess so far so good. Knock on composite, you know, uh, particle board or whatever. Um, but uh, anyway, I mean, you know, it's not I'd say wood, but it, it just because yeah. it looks like wood. It's a not substance formerly known as wood. Yeah, this is this is like MDF board with like contact paper it's slapped hot on dog it. of wood. I mean, it's, you know, it's oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe even less healthy than that. Supposedly, this stuff leaks like formaldehyde or something all hey. the time and is, you know, poisoning you forever. I go, well, I guess we all got to go sometime. So. Whatever. Anyway, Aaron, what have you been uh, <laughs> like doing or viewing or whatever? Oh, I uh, I watched Console Wars on, oh, uh, on CBS, CBS All, All Access. Access. I enjoyed that quite a bit. Uh, What's Console Wars? It's it, what was a book written by Blake T. Nelson. Uh, something like that. It's it, Craig it, T. Nelson. No. Yes, Coach uh, wrote it. <laughs> no, it's. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, it's Blake T. Nelson. It was a book that came out in, like, 2014. Um, it was then auctioned, like, the rights for it was auctioned as a movie and as a TV series. which I believe Seth Rogen picked up both of them. Uh, Blake J. Harris, that's his name. Blake J. Uh, Harris. It's essentially the, uh, uh, going over sort of the history of the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis, but from more of a Sega perspective. Well, I mean, it really, it really starts with... Nintendo is king with NES. Yes, that is true. And then, and then you know, Sega is just like, hey, we need to figure out a presence in the U.S. And then it's all about Tom Kalinske after that. And Tom Kalinske yeah, I... came from Mattel. <laughs> He's, you know, he was. It was a big deal when he got in there, but people didn't, really, you know, it, it, he wasn't in the gaming industry, so it was like, well, this guy's good at selling toys, but this doesn't mean he knows how to sell a console. And it also shows how the U.S. had a lot of. Th- Sega of America, a lot of successes, and then Sega of Japan kind of got mad and and kind of started to throw their weight around a bit and made some decisions that pretty much led was the beginning of the end for. It was a, a Sega little bit of a culture country. clash. Uh, that too. I mean, that too. There, there are there are things that that happened here that are very much uh, would not not they just that that's not how you do business in Japan. That is very true. 
And that's, I mean, to, to recognize this is a story being told from a Sega perspective, from a Sega oh, of course. perspective. Yes, yes, so, yes. I mean, the same idea is like, if you watch King of Kong, maybe not everyone's the evil, like, mustache uh, twirling villain that maybe that movie portrays. No, Steve, um, are you saying Billy Mitchell didn't <laughs> make that movie? I, I'm going to say maybe Billy Mitchell isn't like as evil as that movie portrays him to be. Uh, well, you say that, but evil, but he, much more. Yeah, not an evil, but like, yes, much more recently than that movie. It's like also it's pretty clear you've been cheating uh, on and off. Didn't, but he didn't got that all get, that stuff restored. It got, yeah, it got That's reversed. Baloney. It just, all got it all got reversed. Like that he, all. Yeah, well. He said, hey, listen, uh, I'm going to sue you. Uh, Guinness Book of World Records, which has no money or authority over anything, and they're just like, you know what? We don't care. Haven't they been threatened before? It cannot be the first time somebody like they just Guinness. They, it's <laughs> I mean, not it's a it, daily occurrence. Like, it's not well, even it, the same company it, as it was. Yeah, I was going like, to say it's not really Guinness. It's more uh, uh, it's Galaxy. Just, it's Twin just, Galaxies. They, just, yeah. they just don't care. Twin Galaxy. I don't think they restored anything. Uh, I believe Twin Galaxies is the one that actually restored it. Yeah, because it wasn't. Um, yeah, it was more of a Twin Galaxy all right, all right. thing. I, I will. I'll, I mean, I totally could be wrong, but I do. anyway. So anyway, yeah. So that, that, anyway, back Joseph, to console that's, wars. That's what console wars is about. It's so. a it's a documentary about like essentially the sixteen bit consoles, really, and, and it, mostly about Genesis and Super Nintendo because they don't mention really anyone else. Uh, Atari Jaguar is never mentioned during that whole thing. Uh, no, <laughs> shocking. And it also it's funny how like they talk about the contention between the two, but like I I mean nobody really ever says this, but. I mean, Nintendo shaded Sony, and Sony came back and have completely... I mean, if you think about it, they've had way more success than Nintendo ever in terms of sales? It's insane. No! This is, see, this is the second week you've said this. That, that's, Super it's, Nintendo outsold the Genesis no, no, I'm talking, by, like... I'm talking about Sony. Sony. Oh, Sony. Sorry. I thought you said Sega. <laughs> Sony. I was like... like Yes, like, you were is, right. This yes, is, this is not this discussion again. Like, no, it's, it's just like that people often talk about Nintendo, and, Nintendo and, and, and Sega. It's like okay, cool, but Sony. I mean, the be, you know the best revenge is living well and you know getting thwarted and coming back and sending a hundred million plus units of a, of a console. Well, but but it's, then doesn't Nintendo get that reversed in the Wii generation where they outsell even even at the end of the PlayStation they lifestyle, were like which 80, 80 million. the Wii. The Wii ended three years before the PlayStation Three ended, at least, and still outsold that console. Yeah. So, like, like but it's, I, but I it's like again a discussion of hubris of, of like whoever's the leader doesn't stay the leader. But who I'm just saying the previous generations. I mean, what the the PS2 was the the best selling of all time, right? Uh, yeah, uh, one hundred and ten thousand. That was like one fifty. Uh, I, I thought it was like 110. And anyway, it is the next closest one was 30, 30 million. Like, like the Xbox and GameCube are they got, roughly in the got 20 the to 30 beating. range. Wait, anyway. where's, uh, uh, where's Switch at right now? That's a good question. Uh, 80? 50? I don't know. Where no, I, I think it, I, I thought it was only like 30 so far. Oh, it's, 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 it's a, they all, it all sold the Xbox One. So it's above, it has to be like between around 60 or something, right? Let's let's take a look at the Wikipedia because that'll be the first thing I can find. Uh, Check Doug Bowser's email that, that I gave you access to. Uh, anyway, I, I will find this while. Well, while you do that, I was gonna. Uh, nothing else to mention is anybody see the trailer? For, I don't. I didn't think it was real. Oh, Maybe the Monster Hunter movie. Yes, is that a it's real being, trailer? Yeah, and it's being made by. It's being made. It's starring Mila Jovovich, and it's being made by her husband. <laughs> Who is the Paul same? Paul W. S. Anderson, who made all the right. Resident Evil movies. That looks I was going to say, so it's the same. It's the same pair. Yeah, pair that made the Resident Evil movies. Oh, I so, certainly hope they don't hire any stunt actors. Uh, someone already got like seriously hurt on this movie. Fantastic! Uh, Shut it down. I'm almost. I'm almost certain. I, I don't know how that. they keep giving it to the, like how. Why? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. And I watched the trailer, and Ti is in it, and yes. then. He holds up like a, a gun with a scope, but his closed eyes. <laughs> it's the one that the scope is just like, I can see them. But what? No, you can't. Your closed eyes looking through the scope. <laughs> That's in the trailer? Yes. Okay. 
that he right there is what's happening joseph that that right there is that sets the tone for what you're going but, to see i mean also like if, if we're going to have this discussion this is also like they're they're a military like envoy that somehow got transported to this world with monsters in it or is something. it like, fantasy still? it has nothing to do with the game really yeah it's i don't know why like, they're doing this. there's some military troop in a humvee and like suddenly they get attacked by a monster um <laughs> Uh, so like I, I mean we'll we'll see what happens like yeah hard rocking guys said it's gonna be the RA movies again a lot of CG very little plot yeah I'm not into Monster Hunter so I guess I don't yeah like does I'm Monster like, Hunter really have like a deep story no I always thought I it was just guns like in Monster Hunter though or maybe I'm wrong no nah, like there are there are gun classes like riflemen okay. and that kind of stuff but not not like Scopes military and, hardware yeah. guns like. Everything is still like a fantasy medieval kind of setting. I, there is a story, and especially like Monster Hunter World, the, the latest one has like, hey, this is this is a group going to a new world, and, and that's why like they're separated from. They have to develop essentially and build their their their. But base. aren't they just going to a new world to murder monsters? I mean, they're but they going just to happen set up to do that while they're there. But yeah, I mean, they're it's not. Yeah. They are also setting up a, like. A community or whatever is my understanding and that's like how the there's an also the ice spinoff that came out for this one um but again none of it is milajovic doing karate um which is that's a plus <laughs> which is what dogs Res- in the face which is what the resident evil movies turned into yeah. so uh, anyway it's it's yep it's a video game movie all right and i'll just uh yeah they're rebooting the resident evil movies as well new cast joy of joys know. And last thing I was going to say, I put up two previews, well, one late last week for one for Mini Steel, really small box game, uh, sort of a, a PvP, uh, last person standing kind of game. Pretty cool. I liked it. It seems pretty fun. And I put up a preview for Studies and Sorcery from Weird Giraffe. That got funded. Oh, nice. Like, yeah, a couple of hours. So, yeah, congrats to, to Carla and Chris. Yeah, Chris is a Seattle designer. I know him. He's part of... Uh... Part of my, part of our uh, designer group here. That nice. we, at least before quarantine, we met every Wednesday. So very cool. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. He's a, on... he's a he's a great designer. I expect to see a lot more games coming from him in the near future as well. Yeah, I really like studies and sorcery. I I really did enjoy. It. It's a very tight game. It, it's you got to plan well because you, you can see. You can see that clock going. You can see, like, I only have four more times to do this. So, let me, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. It's push your luck, set collection, that kind of thing. But the push your luck is more if you don't pick up certain resources, you end up putting down more for your opponents to potentially gather more to finish up their yeah, spells through, and things. So, the Winston drafting, which I feel like more games really should use. I don't think I've ever played a board game that used a Winston draft. I don't think that's a term I'm even really familiar with. So please, I was just gonna shake my head and say, and, yes. and enlighten me. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's, if you played Studies and Sorcery, they do Winston's draft. So you basically have uh, three pile, three piles of cards, and then mm-hmm. the deck. So like, uh, you start each pile has one card in it, and so if you're the active player, you look at the first pile and you see the one card, and you decide, am I gonna keep this or am I gonna go look at the next pile? And so that's kind of the push to your luck element where you're like you're pushing your luck to see if the next pile has something better so if you decide not to take it you put it down and then you add a new card from the deck onto that pile and then you look at the next pile and you keep doing that until you get to the final pile and you decide whether you're going to take that pile or you're just going to take a card off the top of the deck and every time you pass a pile that pile gets bigger and bigger for the next uh, player to look through okay so it's, it's cool because like once the piles get big you like Ooh, I really want that next pile because it's probably got a lot of good stuff. But at the same time, it's probably not that good because so many people have passed it up. Um, yeah, including you. There's a memorization yeah. aspect as well. To remember, yeah, there's a lot of worms in that one. Let me just get the first one or what have you. Or if I skip them, you can yeah. either draw from the top of the deck or pick up a stock, or, you know, a vial or a candle or whatever. Anyway, that's it for me. I was going to say, mm-hmm. um, how I can guy put in the chat. He said, "I wonder if Wesker, if the Wesker kids will make a cameo in the Resident Evil movie because that's a that's a Netflix show coming out." Yeah, 
which also no, sounds I don't terrible. Think. I mean, the the CGI uh, like you know Japanese commissioned uh, Resident Evil movies had no references at all to the you know. Well, but they couldn't because they were using the exact same characters. Like right, they oh, like they, they were them. they were separate. They were totally yeah. separate yeah. things. They were like spin off, like you know, zombies in a airport or whatever. I mean, were those movies supposed to be canon? Those CG movies, like video Not game for the canon, Resident Evil, no. whatever cinematic. I believe universe. so. I mean, I whether they said or didn't say they, they said it was, and maybe they said never mind, it isn't. Like it, it really doesn't matter. It's like, did Leon really punch that zombie in the face that one time in that one game? Uh, did, probably. Did Chris punched that boulder. Unfortunately, he did. Right, uh, thank you for reminding me of that. You are welcome. So, all right, Tony, what's up with you? Uh, I'll I'll be real quick. Uh, only two things. Uh, I didn't mention this last week, but I also watched Camp Cretaceous, which is the Jurassic World cartoon that came out on Netflix. I've never heard of this. Yeah, so how was, this was that? From none of I, I'm gonna I, I, this probably people feel this is spoiler, so sorry. None of the marketing would have told you this takes place at the same time Jurassic World is taking place, the the fourth movie in the series. Okay. So, if you know the storyline to that movie, you know a lot of bad stuffs going on. Are there any this, nannies this or anybody? Any you know? This cartoon Childhood has this cartoon has fatalities. Like there are there are like like not not like oh man someone got hit by a laser and they fell like they get eaten by dinosaurs. Yeah, uh, I, I watched the trailer for it and I I I just kept thinking, wow, this could actually be pretty good, but the trailer seems to indicate this is going to be super campy, kitty, and it is not stuff. at all. It is. It is like they so it, it's being positioned as, oh, hey, we're going to set up a summer camp that gets like some behind the scenes looks at Jurassic at Jurassic World, the, the amusement park and whatnot. Um, but within the first episode, you're like, hey, wait, they're talking about the Indominus Rex. Uh, and um, oh, if that's happening, wait, is, is this at the same time? And there is one point where you see. The helicopter from Jurassic World crash into the the uh, aviarium, the where the birds or the pterodactyls and the pter- pterosaurs and whatnot live, and you're like, oh, this is exactly happening at the same time. <laughs> like, I'll say this: it ends with, hey, they have to make it to the evacuation boats um, from the so end of that movie. Does it seem like there's going to be another season of this? Uh, I yes, because stuff happens that. Uh, okay. So you're there are still, that, peop- that there are still people on that island. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Like, we have to go back and like, save all the dinosaurs. All, also, these people. All, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So, so if we're there, you know. We... I mean, again, it the, the big thing about this is it follows the same thing as all Jurassic Park stuff. The adults are inept. Like, there's only two people running this summer camp. And the kids and know all about uh, Linux, right? Is that what? I, not like, <laughs> yes, they, like they all have their own like roles in the, the kids do. But uh, it's like, oh, we're going to leave the kids alone so we can go escalate this issue to uh, Claire Daining, uh, whatever the, God, I'm forgetting the actress's name. Um, Bryce Dallas Howard? Bryce Dallas Howard, yeah, uh, to her. And I'm like, so wait, you're leaving no adults yeah. With these children in this place where there are di- like even if they're just like the the herbivores wandering around, still easily we'll kill these children. Sure, and we're just gonna leave them alone. This makes sense. Uh, we're gonna trust teenagers. That's always a mistake. Uh, so anyway, it, it's it was fun. Like there's a lot of stuff that happens, and like I said, you, you realize quickly and within the first episode, like oh, this is happening at the same time. As what happened in that the fourth Jurassic Park movie? How many episodes? I think six or eight. Okay, that's tolerable. Is it so. is it like painful to Those look at as numbers. an adult? No, I thought like I I enjoyed it. I mean, I think I was playing a DS game at the same time. Like it wasn't <laughs> so. I really wasn't watching it at all. Oh no, I, I like I can tell you all the major beats, and I can tell you like okay. like BD Wong shows up. Uh, and yeah. you're like, oh, okay, somebody from the movies. You mean like, like the uh, actual several people. actor or his character well, I, voiced his by somebody characters else? There, I don't know if he if he voices him or not. Okay. Um, but they like, 
he's he's still being he's weirdly the the wheel turn that they do in Jurassic World and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom where he's just evil, uh, where it's like, is he oh, petting a wet uh, a white well, like, cat somewhere? The, the same idea as like he did in the first movie in the Jurassic World where he's like, oh, I don't have to tell you what I put in the dinosaur I made for you, uh, and you're like, that's weird. Like, why wouldn't you tell us? Uh, and anyway, stuff happens. So, uh, so yeah, so Camp Cretaceous, it's on Netflix. If you're already playing for Netflix, give it a shot. Uh, I, I would be shocked Netflix. if younger kids should watch this. So I think it, it's probably like an E10 plus, but it probably should be a little older because, like I said, like there are parts where people just get eaten. Uh, <laughs> As they should. Like. Uh, I mean, that, so. that's the thing. Sometimes with um, other people. That's called cannibalism. <laughs> Thank you for explaining that. Okay. Uh, the other, the other thing uh, I found out is apparently my nephew has gotten into Pokemon because uh, of you. The card oh, that's game, terrible. well, the card game because he he's been his friends at, at daycare or virtual Zoom. The kids really play po- the, about, play the card game anymore. I don't know. Tons of Good. It, like, and it, it's had an uptick on. On uh, in the in the COVID times, this isn't really a, so, a good thing. An uptick like virtually or uptick like in both, person. Like I mean, there's there's new, a good idea. There's there's new uh, there's new packs that have been coming out based on like different what the seasons and whatnot. I was gonna say based on COVID, like <laughs> they have a, so, a Pokemon named after COVID. Like that might not be so, a good thing. So uh, so I was told I should be prepared if uh, if we're gonna celebrate Thanksgiving, uh, that I should be prepared to play Pokemon and. That means Uncle Dave has to go build a deck. So coronavirus yeah, two. I choose excited you. to build a deck. I have to go build. Yeah, it's, it's like, your deck a, building. You my sister's like, yeah. my sister's like, oh no, you should just use ours. I'm like, no, Uncle Dave has to build a deck. So um, no, we're this is a this. I'm making the sacrifice for my nephew. Uh, like you gonna buy singles and everything and throw this all thing together? No, I'm gonna go buy like some pack, but I'm gonna make sure it's like a water type because. I mean that's that's who I my favorite type of Pokemon is generally water types. And you know, so, I have other deck builders I can suggest. I mean, you know, it's I am a, more than aware of TCGs. <laughs> no, no, no. We no, 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 painfully no, 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 went over no, this. I mean standalone last, like We painfully went over this last week. No, I'm not um, I'm not buying packs of anything. I mean stuff that's self-contained. I'm just a but that's not what my nephew's playing, so That is true. <laughs> uh anyway, so we'll we'll see what happens, but um I, I started looking at like <laughs> Cool. We're gonna. What kind of deck are we gonna put together? Because uh, Uncle Dave's gonna come to play. So, uh, but anyway, let's uh, let's go to games we've played because we are starting this late. So I want to make sure if we can get to people. Yes, um, Joseph. What games have you been enjoying, good sir? Well, currently, lately, I've been watch uh, playing Floor Plan from uh, Deep Water Games. It's a roll and write about planning your perfect home i guess so these days it's kind of hard to play board games with anybody outside of the household and uh it unfortunately is. my my wife actually doesn't like board games you but, too yeah she does not like board games i i've made it's funny i managed to play convince her to play fantastic factories once <laughs> oh wow it's such a gotcha. great game i you could say i made this uh but floor plan i've gotten her to to play it because right right now we're kind of in this house hunting mode mm-hmm. we're we're just like looking around you know for real estate and seeing whether we're thinking about moving maybe but like definitely like you know floor plans are on her mind so see so yeah let's play floor plan so it's a roll and write where you have two dice, you roll them, and that determines either the dimensions of the room you're planning or different like features that you add to the game, like windows, um, trees, furniture, stuff like doors, stuff like that. And different clients want different things like walk-in closets or a shed in the backyard, etc. I'm a big Roland Rice fan. I, I do want to play this game because it looks like it'd be right up my alley. Yeah, it's pretty fun. It's, it's kind of almost like a follow-up to like welcome to um i think it feels a little different but also at the same time feels very similar so i think it's pretty good i think it took us like a game to really like understand all the rules uh but after that it's actually pretty straightforward like almost all the rules are just written on the sheet 
itself. That's how simple it is once you get going with it. I love a good player guide that's succinct. Like these are the eight, you know, well, eight, well, however many things you can do. You go, the designer Merrick Tupi is it Tupi or Tuppy? Uh, I don't know. I think I played. I, I think he's coming out with a game that's going to be published by Talon Strikes called Salon de Paris. Hmm. I had a chance Sounds. to to check that out. I think that's him. I think that's the same guy. Uh, it's it's very different game. It's a worker placement game. It looks very busy. Once you get into it, it's pretty fun. You're basically trying to put paintings into a gallery, and you're working on. Like, you have assistants who can go get you stuff. Not like not not like a Istanbul. Well, not 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 like Istanbul, but you have assistants who can go do stuff for you, and you're gathering up things. It's pretty cool. But yeah, but yeah, floor plan definitely looks like it's something that I need. To, it's on my list actually of things that I need to to grab at some point. Anyway, you, you were. Yeah, it's nice times. and compact. Nice and compact game too. So it's always uh, important when you're running out of shelf space. Story of my life. Uh, I started like tucking <laughs> stuff in the crawl space. <laughs> I got caught. I, stuff in the crawl space? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got oh, man. So many games I need to like thin out of my collection, especially given that have have played so many in, in such a long time. I actually have a friend group where we yeah. have a Slack channel where we're like a buy, sell, trade channel. Okay. And um, I, this, this I is put up a spreadsheet. Right? Yeah, locally. Yeah, I put up a spreadsheet of like all the games I want to get rid of. And then everyone else is like, oh, great. And then they added their like 10, 20 games they want to get rid of. Basically, no one wants to actually get any <laughs> games. Everyone's just trying to get rid of games. <laughs> so I... I uh, there's, there's a lot. Yeah. It, yeah. it becomes a problem. Um, but for, as for other games, as I mentioned, I think I've, I've played some Slay the Spire, but um, I've also been playing a fair amount of uh, Magic the Gathering, um, Commander specifically, uh, using a website called Spell Table. So it's nice because before COVID, we were meeting uh, every other week to play Commander in person. But, you know, ever since quarantine, that hasn't been an option, but we've been using Spell Table. Mm-hmm. Uh, and webcams so that lets us um have you heard of spell table i've heard of it but i know very little but i'm not i've never really played much magic so it's a it's a very cool software that lets you you know have up to four people playing uh, a game of commander at the same time mm-hmm. and the cool technology is that um if you just click on a card that's on in view it will automatically look up that card for oh, you wow and so you can like read the details and uh, whatever. It is this like Eye of Judgment for the PS3? Is that what this kind of is? The camera can recognize what? Yeah, something happens. like that. But it's it's kind of <laughs> um, laughing, it's, it's a it's a bit spotty <laughs> though. It's like Eye of Judgment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a thing. bit spotty though. It kind of only works half the time. But it's it's at least one way that we could still play Commander. Hey, you know, together. Going. Yeah. Gotta do what we can, right? I mean, I play a lot of stuff on TTS, Tabletopia, Board Game Arena. So, you ever use any of those? I'm, I'm not use TTS and Tabletopia, but do you ever use uh, Board Game Arena? Uh, I've heard of Board Game Arena, but I've not used that one. I've I usually use Tabletop Simulator, and occasionally I've used Tabletopia. I recommend Board Game Arena because uh, the games up there there's automation built into them, so you have less oh. pieces to kind of fidget with. Which is kind of nice. nice, and it's free. There also, of course, the premium version as well. But yeah, yeah, I know the scripting for Tabletop Simulator, but I haven't had a chance to like figure out how to put that all together. And it's also hard to find a game that has enough scripting if that's what you're into. Yeah, I think I played the Wingspan, the official Wingspan that was on TTS. I mean, now it's out on Steam, you know, standalone. That so that's pretty good at um, automation in it as well as um, Lords of Waterdeep was one that has some pretty good scripting as well on TTS. But yeah, I mean, I don't know if you're into. I mean, the thing about BGA is working Rin, It has it has stuff like you know, TOT Wakan, but it also has stuff like Potion Explosion. So you get a nice mix of really complex <laughs> uh, dice and worker placement games, and things are a little little more fun and you know quicker so yeah it's pretty mm. neat so yeah i'll have to check it out yeah i uh, see so you uh you have my you have hades on here that, that's a good game i was you know for a while after 
uh, you know, get all the stuff squared away for the Kickstarter and the manufacturing. I was thinking about picking up Hades mm-hmm. um, because with Slate Aspire, I guess, you know, I, I didn't think roguelikes were my my cup of tea, but after playing Slate Aspire, I was like, okay, you know, maybe I'll give some other roguelike games a try. And I love um, uh, the company behind Hades. Like Supergiant, I think, yep. is the name. Like uh, Bastion and um, Transistor. Transistor. Yeah, those are Pyre. really great so, games. I didn't really get into Pyre. I liked it, but I didn't really get into it. Yeah, I didn't play it. I've watched some videos. It didn't seem quite like what I was looking for, but I've heard really good things about Hades. So I was thinking about doing Hades. But then, as I mentioned, I started watching some Minecraft streams. So <laughs> <You> got distracted. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. The, my next game that I play will either be Minecraft or Hades, so we'll see. Well, now that you know the secret to getting Minecraft Education Edition, you should you could take that money you save and buy Hades. I don't know. Are you going to get Hades I, on the Switch, Steam, or Epic Game Store? Oh, interesting. It's on Epic, huh? I mean, my default is Steam. Uh, I don't actually own a Switch. Oh, okay. But, uh, it's tempting to own a switch, actually, <laughs> but that would I feel like that would I, I would just lose all productivity, but which might be OK now after after the Kickstarter is over, um, I can afford to take a little time off and well, I mean, to be fair, games. the switch is almost like some days it feels like just having steam with you on the go because it's just there's so many things that got ported over because why would you not if you could? Well, that's the that's the that's the uh, trap, right? Is it's portable Steam, and so if it's portable, it just means I can be playing in bed. I could be playing like while laying on the couch. Yep. It's just uh, once it's so accessible, then you know I'll probably never come up for air. So <laughs> we want you to come up for air, Joseph. We right. yeah. kind of need air. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of integral. But yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Once I get usually once I get into a video game, I get really into it. So I hey, understood. I, I, I good because I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I have a problem. So all right, Mike, what games have you been playing? Well, uh, a, a few things here. Um, I want to I want to touch on this one first, even though I, I have it listed last because I I already mentioned it before and I put a lot more time into it now. Uh, but the only reason I even started this game at all, or even paid any attention to the fact that it exists, because I don't remember even hearing about this when it came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Neon Abyss uh, is on Game Pass, and it was part of last month's weekly or monthly or whatever uh, like reward thing, like do this and get some points, whatever. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'm sure I can you know, get three achievements in this game before the end of whatever. And then I started playing it, and I'm like, I kind of like this. This is fun. And then I got to a point where I'm like, this is awesome. The problem is, it is a roguelite style game. Mm-hmm. And I think I have this game on the Switch. I have not I should know, right? <laughs> played a lot of these type of games. Uh... And the, the biggest problem I'm running into is... I, I have completed... I, I've, I've beaten three of the bosses. So the way, the way it, the game works is you start off your run... And the first boss that you need to defeat is on the fifth level. Once you've beaten him, you go back to the main, um, uh, the, the hub world part of it. You jump in again. Now the next boss you need to beat is on level six. And then the next one's on level seven. Well, I've beaten the first three bosses. And now it's like level eight. A successful run at this point is a good solid hour. And it's like, if I screw anything up, or if I'm just not like the, the I played earlier tonight, and I was doing pretty well, but I got into this string of levels where I was just not getting any health pickups at all. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? It's it's just there's too much luck involved. And then I just have to start over. And I'm like, well, I, I earned some points uh, for unlocking some permanent stuff. But other than that, that, you know, 40 minutes I put into that run is just all for nothing. And it it feels really frustrating because unlike some other games that I've played where, you know, you unlock some really good permanents that are always there, Mm -hmm. 
this is just most of the permanents are like, oh, you can permanently maybe find that on your next run. I'm like, oh, but well, that's good, but you don't get it off the bat. Yeah, and I, uh. like starting off with the regular gun and no power ups of any kind and no double jumps and no nothing. It's frustrating, and you have to do it again and again. And I'm like, ah. no double jump. Yeah, that sounds. I mean, like I earn a double jump all the time, a double jump, a triple jump. Sometimes I get the thing where I can fly, which is awesome. And I'm like, there's so many items in the game, and it's it's. I need a cheat sheet. Like I wind up going to uh, a, the, like a wiki to look up what all the items do, because that's one of the things in the game. It's like if you've never seen it before, it doesn't tell you what it does until you pick it up. Sometimes those things are not beneficial. Sometimes they are a detriment. And like I, I was playing last night, and it was a really good run. And I picked up this thing called uh, Iron Heart, I think it was. And it, as soon as I picked it up, it gives you the, you know the description of what it does. And it said, your hearts will deplete before your armor. And I'm like, that means my armor's worthless. Like, <laughs> like this, this screwed me over big time. But I kept getting more power-ups. And one of them was, hey, if your arm, like the more armor you have, the faster your your gun will shoot or the more powerful it'll be or something. And I was like, wait a minute, this is an awesome combination now because the fact that my shields will never be depleted means my, you know, my, my firepower is at full max all the time. I was like, oh man, I had no idea. Like, you know, the negative could turn positive. Um, so it's, 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 it's really fun. But I also feel like I I really wish it was more Metroidvania style, where I got to keep everything that I was earning. Gotcha. And that again, that that's really just a function of me not playing that style of game a whole lot. Like I played a little bit of Dead Cells, and uh, it was fun. But I'm like, yeah, I just I didn't get back to it. Um, I mean, when you're playing it right, you're supposed to you know rinse and repeat, and that. I get tired of that as well too. You get something really good. It's like I don't want to. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I just I'm doomed I'm, without that thing that I really liked. You know, so or that's and, how you feel. And you know, it's like once you get all that, all these power ups, and you feel like, oh, I've, I've, I feel like I can, you know, I can take a couple of hits, and my firepower is really good, and everything. There's still a cutoff because you get to a boss, you beat the boss, and it's like that's that is your cutoff for this run. Like you can't just go, oh, I'll I'll keep going and see if I can kill the next boss. It's, nah, you're starting over. I was like, oh, okay, all right. But uh, but anyway, I've I've been enjoying it, and um, I I hope I keep enjoying it at least through the five. It, it clearly there's all kind of like stuff that they don't explain in the in the hub world where it's like there's this elevator and there's a statue and there's this and it's like. I have a feeling once you beat all the bosses, it's going to unlock that stuff, and it's a reason to keep playing and hook you in further. But I'm like, I don't know. I just want to like finish the main game and see what happens. But I assume there isn't really much of a story. It doesn't. It doesn't seem to be. Yeah, I'll jump back um, into it. Um, yeah, I played it once or twice, and then kind of got distracted by some tinsel or something. But yeah. I'll... Yeah, and early on, I was not compelled at all I, in fact the only reason i kept playing was to try to get these like xbox achievements so i could earn like half a nickel for like playing this or whatever half a nickel yeah Talk i mean it's it's it really isn't much but usually it's like pretty easy stuff and you just kind of keep on going but because i just kept playing i eventually was like hey wait a minute this is cool and that's cool and i like that uh, so it you know it it, it I don't know. It builds pretty good, and you know it's got nice pixel uh, uh, pixel art kind of graphics on it. So it's a nice it's, looking game. It controls fairly well. That's what. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I also picked up Star Wars Squadrons, and I I think I kind of did because I let myself like get wrapped up in some of the hype slash the reviews were good, and at that mm -hmm. point I was like, oh really? The reviews say it's a good game. I might as well pick it up now, and you know it's a I mean, a $40 release come next generation, there probably won't be any more of those in, in a physical format anymore. Um, but I started playing it, and I'm not into this game at all. Like, I, I just... 
like I, I I played Wing Commander one on Super Nintendo, which has like a really low frame rate. I was but, gonna say the best platform to play that. I mean, it's you know how do you shove like fourteen different commands into a controller? It's like well, because there's Not combination really button presses for everything. Um, but like that's how I got through that, and then I played Wing Commander three on 3DO, and I I I loved it. I it was fantastic and. And then I bought Wing Commander 4 on PC, and uh, I was never able to shoot down a single ship in the entire game with lasers. Only heat-seeking rockets uh, were uh, was I able to kill anything. Hmm. Because once you get to the point where it's like, oh, it's it's full featured and all of the the HUD stuff and the the tracking and this and that. It's like, this became way more complicated and I, I can't keep up with this anymore. Now, Star Wars Squadrons is not that game, but I got that same feeling the first and every other time somebody was flying straight at me and they went over my head and the little targeting thing was just like, oh, here's a thing, it's behind you. Now you need to like spin around in space to try to find them again. I was like, I have I have flashbacks to this now. I was like I I couldn't do anything, and I I I'm gonna give it one more shot. I think on story mode, just to see if I find anything entertaining out of it. But what I've been hearing since those initial reviews is the story is not the attractive part of the game, and to me that's the only thing interesting about this game, uh, because I I don't care about repetitive dogfights in space. That that's not that's that's not why I liked Wing Commander. I liked Wing Commander because I I thought it was an interesting story. Um, hmm. The Super Nintendo one really wasn't much story. I just I I did think that was kind of entertaining for the time, but I would never go back to that now. Uh, but I just you know it it. It's it's a strange little did game. You, did you play? I, I mean, like X Wing and Tie Fighter, because like this is what this no, game seems like a callback. No, I, but like yeah, the, the reports about that are like those games were definitely more sim like, more yeah. complicated than this game. Um, I mean, I I probably did. I bet I'll bet you anything. At some point, I pirated one of the one or both or all three of those games off of BBSs back in the day, and probably <clears> played <throat> all of them combined for under an hour. Uh, if if that because like I really don't have any memory like I remember them existing and I I I, I don't know they're just it's I I remember uh, playing X Wing and uh, I think I must have had a bootleg copy or something it was on like ten different floppy disks I had to like install them one at a well, time well that's how they were sold back then maybe maybe it was a legit version then it's, you know, oh I still could have been a bootleg I just mean it it may have been an exact <laughs> copy it, th- yeah. there wasn't anything weird about the fact right, that it was like 10 floppy because like the yeah. yeah the original X-Wing was before the CD and then they had yeah. the special editions of X-Wing and TIE Fighter and then X-Wing versus TIE Fighter um, yeah but like any, that, sorry go for it oh I mean, yeah it was remember back in the day just like you insert disc one you know install install now insert disc two it's just it's so crazy to think about. Nowadays, we don't have to deal with that at all. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah thankfully. A data well, piece, but when you have a 70 gig update <clears throat> for Call of Duty Modern Warfare and you wanted to play that night, it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, it's different, yeah, but if, different if, concern. If, it, if yes. it was 14 different discs <clears throat> that you needed to swap back and forth, it would take just as long. Well, but I mean, I, if you want to go with the same idea, what was it EverQuest 2 came on? either two DVDs or eight CDs. Oh, and you get like switch know. between them when you, when you were doing the, ins- like it, it yeah, yeah, like ended up writing. You have to babysit the, the install. Whereas at least but with a download, you can set eight it up and walk away. It True. was either eight or 10 CDs True. and two DVDs. Like this that's was, all. Uh, that's it. No, I'm kidding. I want to, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> like was, whatever was, the last version of windows was that you could get on three and a half inch floppies. It was like, 35 discs. I was yeah, I was going to say I think Windows 98 second edition was something like 40 discs on like that's why those boxes like they conditioned you to, to think all PC software came in an encyclopedia sized book for no reason. This was the reason. They needed to <laughs> fit all those floppies into a giant box. But I mean from from the squadron standpoint and I still haven't played it yet, but my understanding is like 
it kind of gives you the option, at least on PC, on how much you want to engage. Uh, because like you can get the HOTAS and the VR setup, and like you are distributing your power across different systems to like you yes you can you can adjust the power to some degree but there's no levels of gradation it's 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 power towards firepower power towards shields power toward boost or some sort of middle ground hmm. like you can't just let there's no fine tuning any of that gotcha i i thought there was some kind of arcade toggle that was in the options that would oh, allow you to change well that. If there is, yes, from not what, not the version what, that I played. I'll say from that. what I've seen. So okay, but I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm sorry to hear. Like, I don't know that game. Still, I'm still looking forward to playing that game. But I I, I am looking I forward to getting getting it done and getting rid of this disc because I am definitely not hanging on to this game. Gotcha. And if, well, if, got Mike. if I play if I play another thirty minutes and I go, I'm still not having fun. It's gone before I finish it. I, I just. I I soured on it faster than any game that I can remember wow. in uh, in recent memory. I because I was like, oh yeah, this is gonna be fun. Like, oh there, no, this isn't fun. So um, yeah. So I uh, I also I checked out Mario Thirty Five. Uh, I like this game. It's a lot fun. of people, a lot of I've people are like kind of down on this, and and oh, I don't really why? like personally. I don't know why because. People who are like, "Oh, Tetris '99, it's so fun." I hated Tetris '99. Well, I played it I mean, twice and went, "This is pretty cool." I'm never going to play this again. I mean, it's a it to me, it's it was cool. an amusing idea. I don't want to play, but it. that is not how I want to play Tetris. I just it it doesn't. I mean, it, interest me at all. It's okay for all of us all of us to have bad opinions. Like it's fine. So <laughs> I mean, and I, I don't. Yeah, I get it. I guess I'm in the minority on that. Whatever. I I just I I don't care any. Like if if Tetris '99 went away, I wouldn't care. The fact that Mario '35 is going away, yeah, I, I feel like I don't get that because it's pretty. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's well, good. it it needs. It's, it would the need contents. More. The content's not going to continue the same way. Yeah, like this Tetris. Tetris is a game you can play. Like people can still play the original Game Boy version and keep playing Tetris. Like we are going to hit a content limit that allows for Mario one levels and power ups, and you're going to be like, cool. Well, that's where they could they could make adjustments, whether yeah. it's but they you know, clearly don't have adding in other games so. or just doing saying like, all right, we're done with Mario one. Now let's do Mario two. I mean, Hopefully USA and not yeah, gonna, the lost levels. Oh, uh, yeah. but yeah, you know, like they they could keep doing it. But yes, I, I mean the the more I've played it, it's like I'm kind of getting sick of playing one dash one and one dash two. Um, but I, I I've enjoyed it. Like I I can routinely get in the top ten, um, and I I did get a victory one time, and two. uh. The one time I got the victory, I felt like I wasn't doing all that. I mean, I was doing fine. I wasn't screwing up, but I wasn't doing anything to, like, mess anybody else up. I just wasn't getting anything crazy on my screen. I just kept playing. And then it was just like, oh, you, you won. I was like, oh, cool, I guess. Um, let me play some more. And then, you know, there was a deluge of monsters that appeared instantly. So, And then I read that there's a lot of cheating that they've found, you know, people getting engaged in. Which isn't great, but hey, you know, whatever. But I, I played like happen. five or six or ten matches tonight. I don't know. Um, got, I, in fact, I got into the top two tonight, and I was... The <laughs> once I was in the top two... The longer it went, the worse I played. And the other guy, I think, was just like happily jogging down the street and occasionally punching a block and stepping on a Goomba. And I was just like, you know, I'm starting to sweat. I'm like, I can't. Oh, my God, there's a turtle. I'm going to die. <laughs> it's just I in the end, I, I wound up dying by jumping off of a cliff accidentally. So it's like. It isn't necessarily who's the most skilled or whatever. It's yeah, I ran. Out, I forgot to look at the clock and ran out of time. So yeah, yeah. I'm not entirely clear how it works. Where my coins start disappearing and the time seems to start moving a lot faster than it did before. Killing enemies gives you more time too. So 
Yeah, and I, I mean, my goodness, how many times have I picked up that star in one dash one and run through forty eight enemies and then jumped on the flag? Like, it, I'm doing it again and again. Uh, but it, it it seems like there's definitely something that they can send your way that just takes your coins away mm-hmm. or something that you do. I don't know because I'll be like, yeah, I've got like four hundred coins. Next thing I know, I have like a hundred and thirty seven. I'm like, uh, what happened? Yeah, I don't know all. Yeah, I don't really have everything mapped out. I'll yeah. get it between now and but, March. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's fun, but I'll I'll probably just like be done with it eventually. You know, especially if they don't add anything new. Um, the last thing is, I, I, whatever reason, I decided I want to play through all of Sonic One on my Genesis Mini, getting all the Chaos Emeralds using save states because that's how. You, you can do it. And I did it. And I feel like okay. I have absolutely come to the conclusion that Green Hill Zone is a fun stage. Mm-hmm. Marble Hill Zone is an acceptable stage. Mm-hmm. And all of the rest of Sonic 1 is an inex- inexcusable tease where they'll say, hey, you want to run really fast or zip through this loop really quick. At the end, there's always a spike or an enemy, though, so you really shouldn't have done that. Like, why did you make this game like to, to this? Run by all of it, yeah. Like, I, it's... it's funny. Console Wars made me think about that because, of course, it was focused on a lot of Sonic and Mario World. But like, I still love to go back and play Mario World because I can explore. There's keys. There's hidden levels. There's Sonic. You run. You run by everything. Well, you but like it's it's designed to think make you think that that's what you should be doing but i feel like as the game goes the later it gets the more it's just like you want to run nah man you shouldn't have run that's why you died you should have taken it careful but you're like, sonic the hedgehog yeah like so I, you're kind of predisposed to move it's, quickly it, it's yeah. counterintuitive it, it's it, it's super frustrating <clears throat> and um and, and there's no payoff at all the difference between the ending when you get all the chaos emeralds and when you don't mm-hmm. barely imperceptible. What were you going to say, Joseph? Oh, I was saying, especially like they spend the first uh, emerald hills conditioning you to run really fast, right? And so, absolutely, you can yeah. beat Green Hill Zone One by holding right on the D pad and not doing anything else. If you just hold right, you will beat that level. You will never get hit. So it's like, okay, this game should be easy. It's fun. It's showing off the power of the Genesis. The music is good. The sound effects are great. The animation of Sonic is very entertaining. I still say that. Like they, the, the animation uh, of the character, absolutely fantastic um, for, for its time. I mean, like the, the sprite work and everything. It's, mm-hmm. it's like they put so much work into it, and so much of it is good. It's just the game goes from, hey, this is neat, to... I hate you, and I don't really care that you turned into a joke. Oh, but like, so that's that's the funny thing from Console Wars that they had already built the whole infrastructure for Sonic before they knew what yeah, Sonic, like it was, what the, it was the character in, was going to be. That was also in high fast. score. Yeah, the, in high the score, like, one. Yeah, like they built they had built this this fast engine infrastructure, let's call it, that allowed them to do loop to loops and all that stuff. Uh, and then they figure out, like, hey, this is going to be Sonic the Hedgehog. Sure. Um, so, I, I mean, yeah, I, don't, I Sonic One's a rough game. <laughs> so, but I never felt like any of the I like I I like Sonic One, despite mm-hmm. what I just said. I overall I think it did what it needed to do. I liked Sonic Two, and I liked Sonic CD. After that, <laughs> I don't care about Sonic Honestly, anymore. They're all the same to me. I, I don't really. Like three, I, it's, not, it's not enough to do for me to, you know. I, but I never owned a Genesis. I was a Super Nintendo kid, so I was playing Mario World. And to this day, you've never owned like a legit Genesis. Nope. That's I, crazy. I have a shelf of Genesis games on it that I play on my Retron. Or of course, I have all the ROM, all that crap. But never owned a Genesis. No. I, I mean, I didn't own one until the end of high school. I didn't get a PlayStation One until like two thousand four. Oh. Yeah, Weirdo. same deal for me. Never owned a Genesis. I don't think I ever owned a PS1. I went to mostly Nintendo and, and then PS2. 
Why well, a PS2 is basically a PS1. You just you know put your PS1 disc in and it works just fine. Music mm. controllers, I mean, yes, memory from cards, everything. From, yes, from backwards compatibility and whatnot. Yeah. 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 But uh, anyway, that's that's kind of what uh, what I've been playing. So, Aaron, you got you got your breakdown. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll move through it swiftly. Uh, I played a game called Fairy Season. Uh, my wife and my oldest. Uh, trick taking game. You're trying to like collect fairies and you have traps. Basically, you get one point for like each fairy you get like the end of the game. So you're trying you're trying to like you, you can put out. Basically, you're moving from spring to to summer to fall to winter. My wife was like, "Well, why wouldn't they start off with winter? Because winter is obviously the the first season in the year, but that's not how the game is. So you have to move in that order." So you're putting this cards feels down. this feels like a, is the beginning of the week, Monday, Sunday or sa- like is it the yeah. end of Saturday? Well, like, that feels like that discussion there. That's a little more subjective. Like, well, no, actually, why, it's, it's why, all subjective. Why is, it's based why, on where you I was going to say, like, why isn't subjective. why isn't winter if you live in North America? Uh, why isn't winter the end? Because that's where everything dies. Like. It was the end and the beginning, so I don't know. It, it was fun, really good, really good art, good quality cards. Different way of thinking about it, but so my wife thought that the numbers on the cards were like your points. I was like, no, you really get a point for like each fairy you end up getting. She's like, so so this eight is worth as much as this two. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so that kind of took her out of it. She was just like, why? I said, well, that would be a different game. That means you could have seven cards because you played really well. Somebody gets one eight, and they could win if you had like seven ones or something you know which it'd be a different game it, it would change how you would play it but that's fine um play some hoop gods with my youngest today finally got that to the table we really like it it's fun it's it's quick i actually won because she literally half the game everything she would roll like she'd roll everything perfectly I'm like how are you doing this like because you know because the dice have like hands like feet for like jumping a ball for shooting uh like blocking and it's just she would every time she'd just throw them out there and be like oh that's what i need because you're basically trying to roll a set of three things before the, the other person so and it's yeah but i actually ended up winning which is very surprising because normally she beats me and everything but that was cool uh we played some tattoo stories over the weekend that's a game where you there's cars that have words on them or phrases what is words and you take 10, you pick five, you lay them out, and everybody else has to draw a tattoo with all those elements in it and then pitch it to you. So hilarity always ensues because I can't draw for anything. My wife can. She's pretty good at drawing things. So um, I'm terrible. But sometimes, you know, even if your drawing is awful, if you pitch it right, you know, people might, you know, give you a little something for it. So that worked out okay. Um, I actually played Takenoko for the first time. It's funny. A friend gave me Takenoko the actual you know analog game i've never played it and actually played um with uh panda angel over the weekend she showed me how to play it with amanda and it is i don't know why i haven't played it. it's fantastic so yeah joseph have you played uh takenoko before uh no i have not i had to actually make sure it was the game i was thinking about because i always confuse takenoko with tokaido but uh oh i have takenoko too i play that more often Takanoko is the bamboo one, right? Yes, with the the okay. panda and the farmer and all that stuff. No, I, yeah, I have not. I have not played that one. I played Takaido, but not Takanoko. It's funny. I love Takaido. I've only played it one time, in my own copy, and I love it. But I've only played it once. Uh, you know, I had a copy of it, and same thing. I played it once, and it's very, yeah, a very peaceful game. But like that box, it's the most egregious box I've ever seen. It's like, <laughs> it's massive. It's like four inches three or four inches thick which version do you have i have like the regular one i don't have like the do you have like the the, the premium no one? I, I think it's regular but like the box is like 14 inches by 14 inches or something wow. and then I, it, it's um but like inside of it it's just like two stacks of cards and then the board is like ma- like unnecessarily massive and then the box is like 95 percent air yeah it's funny you said that i think about the game i was mentioning fairy season it's like mm-hmm. I don't know eighty cards, and that's the game. In this box, it's like this big. It's like I mean the art is great. It's just like 
Okay, well, you know. That works that works out for you. So uh play some Takanoko. Um previewing another game called Space Dinos from Peyoto Games. Very fun. Uh tile placement. There's dinosaurs in space and you you're trying to build like a six by six grid communally. It's not co op though, with other people and you can't have the same number or color in the row or column, so it gets pretty tricky. But I like it. It's pretty fun. Um, when I came in for review, it's called Off Topic. It's pretty much like uh, categories, but it's not categories. It's it feel it, it's categories pretty much, but it's not categories. So I'm pretty sure we're gonna like that one. Um, I play these are analog games. So I play them on Steam or what have you. So I play some Wingspan on Steam. The AI still beats the crap out of me in that game, but I'm trying to practice because we're supposed to be playing with Elizabeth in a couple of weeks, and I know she's oh, going wow. to win, but <laughs> I at least want to make it interesting. <laughs> so, I'm okay losing; it's fine. I'm used to it, but I at least want to make it interesting. Uh, so yeah, Wingspan. I'm still playing Square for Hire on my phone and tablet. I still can't get 25 points. I don't know, I, but I keep trying. It's like. You get cars, you have to layer them such that like certain you're covering up things that you lose points for, but then putting items together that you earn bonus points for. I love it, but I just can't seem to win. But I keep coming back. So uh Tesoro, somebody made a really good version on Steam, like another one. It's beautiful. So I'm playing Tesoro before. Have you play that? Um Tesoro, it's like basically uh you're like a square board and you have these little stones that move along like these two little like this place this lines going through the whole thing but every every character like moves along these two lines that snake through the level <clears throat> and you play tiles that indicate you put a tile down that's how you move and you can eliminate other players by having them by forcing them to like loop like if the people go into a wall like the edge of the board they lose or if you go into another player i think either the person moving wins, and the person that gets that gets hit loses. Very fun game. Um, still playing Splendor with Mike J. He's on a five to six game winning streak on that one. I don't know why I'm just why my Splendor brain has left me. I used to be pretty good, and now I'm like, <laughs> so Mike, I'm practicing. <laughs> so I'll be back to make it competitive. <laughs> um, and I'll play more. I know Charterstone just came out on the Switch. I have it on Steam. And I might have it on my tablet, but I don't remember. Um, I need to remember how to you, play it. Sorry, go ahead. Jeff. You playing? So, are you playing solo? Uh, well, I started it. I learned to uh, actually. Uh, you know, Suzanne from Dice Tower Salt and Sass. She taught me how to play on the Steam version, and it all made sense. And of course, because I've been going back, I've forgotten a lot of it. Uh, but I think we just did. I think we started a campaign, but I don't. That I don't remember. So I don't know, hmm. but it, oh. I don't. But Mike J, I, I've been talking. I've been talking up to Mike J, a friend of ours, friend of real life, um, friend of the show, a friend of real life. You know all, all those phrases that we say. Uh, we, I was maybe trying to convince him, like, hey, grab it on Switch. I'm hoping it's cross play. I'd probably check on that. And if we play, I can we could definitely just you know do the legacy thing and keep it going. So that could be fun. And other stuff I gotta do some make some content for is Shadow Network came in from Talon Strikes, very fun game collecting brief. You know, it's uh, '60s Cold Cold War era. You're collecting intel and trying to like get information, that kind of thing. And then I really need to get back into Root on Steam, and I think I have it on my on my tablet as well. So gotta get into those. And in terms of digital games, Crash Four, I've been playing that. Never really big a big into crash bandicoot but i don't know it's fun i don't know i like platformers so Sometimes i wish you could tilt the camera a little bit more as so you could see some more of the depth but they do put like a little ring around crashes or any character's shadow so you kind of see where you're landing a little easier but I don't know, i'm liking it um still playing a ton of new super lucky's tale love that game 3d platformer collect the thumb but not like banjo like you can actually, I can, you can do 100% a level in like 10 minutes. It's not going to take you like four hours. Gotcha. Still playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Um, how, how old is that game now, Modern Warfare? Oh, this is the new uh, one. This the, is, the remake. The, this, oh. year's, this year's release was also called Modern Warfare. Yeah. 
Like uh, the exact same title? Yep. Yes. And it's the... <laughs> It's like, I mean, it's not. It's not Call of Duty. Before. It's not Call of Duty for Modern Warfare. Yeah, it's just Call of Duty. Is what Warfare. they'll make the difference. That's oh, true. okay. I forgot it was four. Yeah. Hmm. So, but yeah, uh, <laughs> they ran they, out of names. They kind of did, and I'm playing Leisure. They're still making Leisure Suit Larry games. So I'm playing Leisure Suit Larry. Wet dreams don't dry, and I'm kind of wondering. Is that the Kickstarter one? If so, be, I played. I played like through that one because I kickstarted it. No, the, no, so. no, this is the one. There was one that's like wet. There was one before about wet dream. This one is playing off of that. Uh, this one just gotcha. came out, and I'm wondering like then, why am I uh, playing this game? But we'll see. that's a good question. Um, because it, it asks you for like a. It's like a quiz when you first start, like to see how old you are. And one of the questions was like, "What is the name of Boo in Monsters Inc." And I did not know what Boo's first name was. I had to look it up. Anybody know right, what, the, what, what Boo's first name is in Monsters, Inc.? I was going to say everyone would have to look it up. Exactly. But but other questions I had to look up. Like you know, One question was like, what is Cash 22? It was like, it's a book, it's a movie, it's a thing. It's a book. Um, Mary Gibbs. Yep. That is Boo's is, first is name. Boo's, yep. I, I would not have known that. Nor would I'm I. sure there's something in the background that says her name but yeah, yeah do they mention it ever i don't i feel like I, i'm willing to bet it's, it's based on or something might have that in it. i'm willing to bet there's like drawings in the background that have her name on it like she signed them but they never say that in the movie i don't there's recall no way they say it in the movie and i don't like uh, anyway then the last thing is i'm playing i've started the kingdoms of amalur the re what do they call it? the, the re, whatever the remake the re-reckoning the re-reckoning yeah so oh it's that combat is so much fun, man. I gotta say, they really they give you the the sword, then you get the bow and arrow, the shield, and being able like slowing down time and blocking the shots. It's that but, combat I mean, is really fun. Isn't that combat just Fable combat? Yes, but I haven't played Fable in a while, so I don't really remember. Okay, just, just a second. <laughs> All right, I'm done. That's it for me. Uh, then I'll finish this up real quick because I only have two games. Uh, I finished Time Splitters Future Perfect. Great game on Xbox. It is a very good game. Uh, I do not like the end of that game because at one point you have to cover your past self with a sniper rifle, but you're shooting invisible enemies. And I'm sure it was probably easier to see like the predator, like semi-translucent on like a CRT. But when I'm line doubling it and using it on a 4K monitor, uh, everything's blurry. So they didn't stick out that well. (laughs) Um, so that, that was, that was a little bit tough, but ultimately that game is great. I really wish they would make, they do some kind of upright version. Yeah. It got canceled. Well, the, the, the sequel or whatever they're going to do. Did it get canceled? I thought, I thought it ultimately did. THQ Nordic were supposed to oh, be. Hey, if they're bringing it back, I would love it. I'm a big Because so, they own it, I believe. So anyway, uh, and then I've gone back to play through Chrono Trigger on DS again for, I don't know. Why? The fifth time. I'm just that game's up. great. I've I have started it and tried to continue on the DS version about eight times, and I'm just like, I don't want to sit here and look at the screen. So I, I play. I mean, I played through it <laughs> twice on DS. Um, like I mean, Chrono Trigger is a, a classic game, yeah, and again, I, I don't I, have I, I don't have nostalgia for. If you said Secret of Man, I don't either. Though, like I didn't. Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't have a. I only had a Super Nintendo the last year before the N sixty four came out. So I could not explain why, but the DS version is the only version of a Chrono Trigger that I gave up on. But I played through it on SNES. I played through it on PS one. That's then, impressive because the PS one just has crazy, the, crazy. The load, load the load times are terrible, but I yeah, I got through that and Final Fantasy four, which also has terrible load times. Um. Because I I like those games. They're great. I mean, the music is fantastic. And that's it. Like, I'd love to... I'd love to find a ROM that combines the the anime cutscenes from the PS1, the translation from the DS, and, like, the MSU1 chip. Like, you could do the the orchestral music. Um, Like, that'd be great. I play it on my... my, my, uh, Oh, my God, Mr... Or on the SNES Classic. I was, I was gonna say, like that's, that sounds like week. emulation will take care of that, no problem. But the best I can find is, oh, here's one that has an updated translation and maybe the orchestral music, but yeah, not we got the cutscenes. Hey, uh, hey. So. 
this book of nerds and yo what's going on and amanda and flat out games so everyone's uh, so here yeah. to party now exactly <laughs> flat out games so yes yeah, so, so uh so yeah so chrono trigger uh, i'm i have well i'm in the second time frame or time period now hmm. so we'll see how far i get i mean i just keep my ds on me and when i have time to play i play as I say that, and then look around and realize I don't know. Oh, there it is. Twin flower. So. Daryl with one R. Even though there's two R's in Daryl's name. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, reading, I'm reading names of people who are rating. Hello, everybody. Understood. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So, I mean, that wraps up games we played. Uh, really, I, I think news and feedback stuff, the, the big thing was, I think a lot of people watched a guy tear down a PS5 today. Yep. Uh, one of the guys who designed it. One of the engineers. So. Right. Yeah. So it's a pretty big heat sink. That's what I, that's my takeaway. And there's a slot for a uh, an M2 M E yeah. or M2 uh, and, but there's but there's nobody making drives for that, no. that the PS5 support yet, which is interesting. No, Sony has not identified what drives. Yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not. It's, be... it's not that there aren't drives out there. Sony hasn't told us what are the requirements. But so that I'm assuming that those drives, drives will take advantage of what their internal SSD well, I mean, can do. But it should be fourth fourth gen M.2 true, true, NVMe right. drives, right? Right. And it's the question is they still haven't talked about like is it a memory constraint or if it's a write constraint. So based on how SSDs are now rated, there are different levels of SSD that allow for a number of writes before failure and um and it's funny because as SSDs became more popular, we've actually relaxed the restrictions on how uh, memory works inside of them. That yeah, it's that's kinda, how they got cheaper. Right, they got cheaper because we we use less quality parts. Anyway, yeah, that, there's there's a whole there's a whole back to that. But but that's why Sony's saying, hey, there will be a class of drive we will support. We ha- they still haven't announced what that is yet, so we can't quantify. Where that's going to be? Um, Will they be two hundred? They're also, a pop? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, probably. Uh, and then the other thing is they're using liquid metal for cooling. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Uh, which is oh yes. Only only a couple only a couple consumer grade products are really using right now. Shape changing um, liquid metal. Yes, uh, they they put a T two brand each, liquid metal in, in each PlayStation Five. Um, and actually, Edward Furlong injects it into each PS Five. That's so, why it's so I mean, expensive. So so that that's an interesting one and then I guess the last thing is that all the drives are either or all the ports except for one are either super speed or uh what was the USB C type that they were using? 3.2? Like, it well like for super speed USB 3.1 is a 10 gig instead of the regular which is a 5 gig limit which is also what's on the Xbox Series X and whatnot. Um, drive the largest I, square footage will be support. I don't care. Like it's like that kind of stuff seems. It's the same idea as like, oh, they support uh, IP6 or Wi-Fi six. Yeah, like, that's cool. That too. Wi-Fi six is going to be more impressive for how your router hand like prioritizes different traffic. Um, but the bandwidth than, isn't really that much more significant than AC. I it, I mean there is there is a benefit to the bandwidth, but. I'll put it this way: It's not going to matter if Sony keeps using the same distri- content distribution network that's garbage, uh, because <laughs> it can be as fast as you want inside your network. But when you're downloading the game and you're still only getting 100 kilobits, you a mean second, the 150 gig game, overnight. right? Like, yeah, it's it's only it's not going to matter how, because it's gonna, still going to be slow to your house. Um, it'll be real quick between your router and your PlayStation Five, though. Might um, help with online play, though, right? Uh, again, yeah. depends on what you're using. Perhaps. If you're doing peer to peer. Yeah, depends on your piece. If it's doing a centralized, um, depends on the infrastructure. Does the Series X have Wi-Fi no. six? It does not. It has Wi-Fi five. Oh, so there's the other thing. No but if gonna... you're hardwiring your consoles, like it you should be, right? It doesn't matter. That either sounds way awfully judgy, both... but because I do it, I'm not offended. I was going to say they, <laughs> they both they both have the same LAN oh, I'm connector. Good. So uh, yeah, if you're if you're if you're really worried about multiplayer games like that. You, sh- you should be using hard. You should be playing on a Switch, essentially. Yeah, that's that's the platform that you really should care about. Network. We are we are getting dangerously uh, close to uh, running out of time here. So. Uh... So I mean, I, anyway, yeah, like that, that's the cool stuff. I think the PS Five, like everyone's talking about its size, whatever. 
Um, do I think a lot of people, a lot of like normal consumers are going to crack it open so they can get to the M2 slot to upgrade <laughs> the hard drive? Probably not. No. Uh, the one thing I did notice is the sides are kept on by tension clips, mm -hmm. which just makes me wonder like how hard you have to push to open it. It looked like and he was sort of not struggling, but was trying like not to snap the plastic. Uh, and right, but that's because he knows not to snap the plastic. Yeah, but so uh, yeah. we'll we'll see. Uh, anything I, I look at that and I say, as long as you keep it out of the reach of kids, who cares? Um, yeah, nobody has those. So, exactly. I, I mean, I don't have to worry about that though. So <laughs> well, mine are older, but they they spill hey. things. So they, they you know, so. They uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think both of these systems are like kind of. Magnet, like just have some great ideas and some how they're moving storage forward in the PS5 is crazy. Um, with how 5.5 uh, gigabit per second, gigabyte per yeah, second max, which is nuts. Yeah, the throughput. Like, I don't know if I totally agree when people are like, oh, you can do ratchet and clank on any other system. I'm like, I don't know about that, but I'm pretty sure this probably helps uh, if you're streaming everything off of your, your hard drive. Um, because again, the disk drive is. N nebulous. Like well, Scoop Moose says whatever drive is uh, is has the largest square footage will be supported. So there, there you go. <laughs> so I, I mean, whatever. It, it's really PS Five yeah, then the hard drive. Which is, you know, they're both going to be expensive to expand. So just get used to it. Yes, they will. Also, just remember you can plug an external hard drive in. You can essentially near storage yep. software and then just move it back to back the SSD when you want to use it. Which means um, a lot of games you're just never you're never really going to play them because I got to well, transfer I, it over. Forget it. But I'm again, bad. with if you're using the super speed slots or the USB C slot on the PS5, like that is a legit advantage to moving software. True. So, that that's my plan in the early stages of this generation, at the very least. And it should be for everyone. You shouldn't like. Unlike with the Switch, your first day purchase shouldn't be, oh, and I need additional storage. <laughs> um, but uh, that's we'll see what happens with that 4K Switch that's rumored. So when it comes to 64 gigs of memory, you'd be like, what the hell are we doing? Um, All right, we should probably wrap up. No, let's get out of here. All right. Um, Joseph, shout outs, plugs, all those wonderful things. Yeah, well, first things first, I guess. Uh, I have a live Kickstarter right now going on for the uh, Fantastic Factories expansion called Manufactions. So it's on Kickstarter right now. Go check it out. And uh, October is a super crowded month for <laughs> Kickstarters. So um, two people from my design group actually have live Kickstarters as well. Cascadia, um, designed by Randy Flynn and uh, being published by Flat Out Games, is also on Kickstarter, and they're doing really well. It's... Um, a tiling board game that's set in the Pacific Northwest. It's like a two-layered spatial puzzle. It's really cool. And then I think we early, mentioned it earlier in the episode, uh, Studies in Sorcery yep. from Chris Glenn. He's from our design group as well, being published by Weird Giraffe. Uh, it's a fun Winston Draft recipe fulfillment game about, um, about sorcery, raising the dead, crafting potions, and all that. So I've learned two then, new mechanic uh, things. Winston drafting. I know drafting. Winston drafting. And then recipe fulfillment. I like that. I'm going to use that. Yeah, it's kind of, it's similar to like set collection, but more it's, it's more, more like you have. Yeah, yeah it's I like, that. like I you that. need these things instead of like a collection of these things, when, depending on which recipes you pick up. So, yeah. Mm. And then finally, uh, if anyone's interested in following me, I'm, uh, um, I'm on Twitter. My handle is fanfactories. And that's where I'm probably the most active. All right. Well, all the links, everything will be in the show notes. I'm not sure if uh, the uh, Flat Out Games uh, Twitch account is, is still <laughs> is still watching. But yeah, Cascadia looks looks fantastic. I have not played it, but I'm definitely interested in it. And I think a lot of the games out of out of Flat Out. But yeah, definitely all the links, especially the one to your Kickstarter, will be in the show notes, so people can click on it and, and support you and. Uh, whether it's there or on Twitch or what have you, but thank you for joining us. We appreciate uh, your time. Yeah, it's fun chatting with everyone and, and talking about video games as well, which is not something I, I get to do very often, actually. So. Oh, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Glad you enjoyed it, Mike. Quick shout-outs, plugs. I 
as I always do, encourage anyone who is eligible to donate blood and if uh, those people or anyone has any pets to have them spayed or neutered. By a professional. <laughs> by, of course, by a professional. What, why, what, why would you what, else, what else might you be thinking? <laughs> nothing. Nothing at all. Everything's above board here. Everything. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, just thank you once again, uh, Joseph, for joining us. Thank you to the listeners, people in the chat. We appreciate you. If you want to leave us feedback, you can always email us at podcast.gamethuse.com or leave us a voicemail at 202-573-7686. Tiny. Hey, I, I can't believe we're less than a month away from Extra Life Game Day. So if you want to raise money for your local Children's Miracle Network Hospital, you can go to extra-life.org. And sign up to raise for 170 for children's hospitals across Canada and the U.S. Uh, and get friends and family to sponsor you. And then you have a great excuse to play games for 24 hours. Uh, and if you can't take part, you can follow the link at the top, extra-life.org slash team slash Game Enthused 2020. And donate to your favorite Game Enthused personality. Uh, like we announced last week, we just crossed $75,000 raised for our hospital since we started doing this about 10 years ago. Uh, and we're looking to get to 100000 so go there, donate to, uh, you know, the guy racing for the oldest children's hospital, children's hospital of Philadelphia, uh, myself. And, uh, yeah, check that out. Go to extra life. All right. And we actually made it like barely. <laughs> if I stop talking, we'll actually make it. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, thank you once again, Joseph. Uh, like everybody else who's, who's watching, listening, what have you, uh, Lord willing, we'll be back next week. Have a good night. Later. Night. Good night.